<laughs> I like the caveat. Now let's bring this back to an investor case. I've got two questions for you to round out today. Now, first of all, uh, I want to take this back to when we were last in uh, Fort Lauderdale, not Miami, as I keep uh, telling everybody, uh, when we were in Fort Lauderdale together. And uh, I was blessed by watching the fantastic Robert Friedland speak. Now, this is your conference and I'm not meant to gush about how fantastic he is to watch, but he's just, he's You were, you were. Yeah, I was, I was gushing. <laughs> um, he's entertaining and informative and he's an absolute not miss at your conferences. However, he brought up the um, a, a sort of what seemed like an obscure issue to investors. And I want to talk about a little bit about how these matter when you're building an investment case for investing in mining. But he touched on dry stacked tailings and why this is information investors should know about. But tell me, why would he bring this up um, as part of really something that, you know, increases the cost for shareholders and mining companies? Well, I think I think what he talks about, which is to say that the mining industry needs to pay increasing attention to the real and potential environmental liabilities uh, that they're responsible for as the world goes to more and more mining. And as more and more mining takes place in societies that perhaps don't have the capacity or the will to regulate it well. There are a variety of issues. The uh, tailings dam failure, the catastrophic tailings dam failure in Brazil would be an example. Uh, There have been wonderful advances in tailing technologies, but they're expensive. One of them is to reduce the water balance in tailings, which is to say dry uh, stack tailings, to move the tailings uh, in place with much less water and reduce the probability of collapse. Now, it's also fair to note that Robert makes this point from the point of view of somebody who is mining very high-grade copper and won't generate very much by way of tailings. But nonetheless, what Robert talks about is a real issue. And I think that investors need to consider themselves, uh, consider in themselves some of the big issues that face the mining industry, which is to say real environmental considerations. What do you do as an industry to prevent the distribution of deleterious materials, water and dust as an example, from mining operations? How do you ensure the stability of things like tailings and things like mine wastewater for decades after the closure of the mine? How do you uh, continue the admirable job that the industry has done at making mining a safer profession? How do we bring more people back out of those holes in the ground alive and uninjured? How do we involve more local people in mining, particularly in emerging and frontier markets? How do we deal with the increasing demand for social rents that always occur, that always uh, accompany increases in commodity prices? Too many investors, when they look at the mining business, uh, focus their entire attention on dividend yield and commodity prices. And sadly, uh, a cursory look uh, at an industry, a, a narrative look, an emotional look, is a wonderful way to lose money. Uh, investors need to look for opportunity where other people don't see it. And they need to look uh, at the very fullness of risks around mining. In blatant self-promotion, that rule investment media, if you go there, you can see something called the mining investment classroom. Albert Liu and I are doing a 32-part series on the consideration that investors need to put into various aspects of investing in natural resources and mining. Uh, This is not, by the way, information light. This will require people to do some work, but the price is right. It's absolutely free. Uh, And we talk about these, what we refer to as unexploded bombs, Uh, people, things that people should look at when considering investments in extractive industries. So thank you for the opportunity for an unabashed commercial. I had no idea that question was even going to take us there, but uh, joke's on you because I said I had one more question left uh, because you've given me that fabulous answer. I'm going to follow up. I've got a follow-up question for you. 
What you've talked about there is uh, a, a great line, actually, bringing more people back out of the ground alive because it's something that's not talked about in the mining industry a lot. It's sort of like 15,000 people a year die from um, die in mining-relating accidents worldwide. It's a huge right. number, and this isn't to talk about the high suicide rate attached with mining in Western countries as well. Um, and I, look, this is a little bit macabre, but I am getting somewhere. Uh, I was recently, at the end of last year, I was at a gold industry conference that talked about what the industry needed to do to attack, uh, attract more Gen Zs to the sector. Because at the end of the day, Gen Zs are going to be the next people taking over mining. And you would know this quite well. There is a lot of this generation that is not interested in mining. They're not impressed with extractive industries. Now, granted, recycling and technology of above ground resources has a, a long way to come and trillions of dollars in investment won't even change it just yet. But how do you highlight the great miners, and you know a lot of these people personally, how do you highlight the great miners, uh, the great industry leaders and the great companies that are doing this environmental work uh, and putting social, uh, social uh, I've, I've lost the word here, social issues at the forefront of what they're doing? And how do you get Gen Zs to see that that change is being made? I think that's happening right now, actually. I think it needs to happen faster. I point as an example to my friend Bob Quartermain. Uh, when he built Pretium Resources. Uh, the first thing Bob did was, rec was recognize in Northwestern British Columbia in a remote location that flying a bunch of white people from Vancouver up to Northern BC was inefficient when there were a whole bunch of native people who were unemployed who lived in the region and wanted to work there. It, it was a training challenge. You took a population base that hadn't had industrial employment before and turned them into mine workers and, and you had to teach them uh, not to mine in the old-fashioned way, which is to say pick and shovels, but rather to operate remote trams, <laughs> remote drills. Uh, but it worked. The labor force uh, at the Predium mine is probably now 40% native, 40% uh, first-generation industrial workers. Happy to be there. You don't have to fly them in. You don't have to fly them out. There's lots and lots and lots of women in that workforce. I, I know you're not supposed to say that there are differences, but there are differences. Uh, as an example, in a prior incarnation, uh, Bob Quartermain learned uh, when dealing with Andina populations in the northern Andes, uh, you're going to love this, Shay, you're probably going to cut me off, but <laughs> women have uh, some sense of doing what they're asked to do. So... In, in driving uh, haul pack, big trucks, uh, it turns out that these tires are worth $24,000 each. And tire wear is an important cost consideration. If one drives these trucks at, at sort of 14 kilometers per hour, one maximizes tire wear. The men, irrespective of how fast they were told to drive, drove as fast as they wanted to. And the women, it turned out, drived, drove, pardon me, at the speeds that they were asked, prolonging engine life, <laughs> minimizing wear and tear on equipment, minimizing wear and tear on tires. The consequence of that is that Quartermain figured out that if you're going to employ somebody to drive haul pack trucks, you ought, in fact, to employ women. Um, all of which goes to say there is a generation of miners now that is willing to spend the money on training. It is training, first of all, that substitutes capital for labor and puts equipment in the way of rock falls, puts equipment in the way of explosions, puts equipment in the way uh, of uh, gas uh, poisoning. So to the extent that more mining can be done mechanically, to the extent that people can employ capital, rather than picks and shovels, the industry becomes much, much safer. Uh, it used to be, when I was coming up in the business, that everybody above a mucker looked just like me. Big, old, fat, either bald or blonde white guys, uh, irrespective of whether they were in northern Canada or in the high Andes in Chile or in Congo. Uh, mercifully, now all kinds of people work in mining. You know, if, if you go to uh, the barrack operations that Bristow operates uh, in the Ivory Coast, it isn't just the miners who are uh, Ivorian. 
the people who run the mines, the accountants, the geologists, the engineers, our locals, that's wonderful. They want to be there. And mining in a country like the Ivory Coast or Guinea uh, is a high status job. There are all kinds of wonderful people there whose lives are constrained because of a lack of opportunity. Mining provides the opportunity. Using an underutilized person where they'd like to be uh, is really where we all to where we all need to be. And the end, the problem in the West is bigger than just mining. Shay, uh, Mike Rowe who did the PBS series on dirty jobs in the United States, points out that there are 7 million jobs unclaimed in the United States that can provide middle-class living. They are jobs in factories. They're jobs being plumbers. They're jobs in uh, heating uh, and air conditioning. 7 million trade jobs that provide middle-class livings are going unclaimed while young kids are going $150,000 in debt to get college educations that equip them to do nothing. So partially, I think that young people themselves will understand that so-called status is no substitute for money. Uh, and they will begin to uh, quit aspiring to becoming professors of basket weaving uh, and live in their parents' basement for the rest of time uh, in favor of operating around what are really generally pretty nice people uh, in businesses like mining and oil and gas and, yes, plumbing. I, I'm, I, I think it's a non-problem, Shay. I think it's a problem for 10 years. But if people, if people recognize that they need to be self-serving, I think most people over time, irrespective of age, gender, or race, are going to choose a nice life as opposed to a lousy life. So I think it'll sort itself out over time. It'll just be messy between now and then. Interesting. Okay. I like your perspective on that. Uh, before we uh, move to my final question, I loathe to comment on the difference between genders. I do. I hate getting into these. <laughs> However, there is a bit of folklore. I was up visiting Mount Isa, which is a base metals mine in the yeah, top northern part of Australia. I'm sure you know where it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there was at the peak of the Australian mining boom, there were stories going around that the miners were supposedly going to local supermarkets and tapping the checkout chicks on the shoulder. Well, that's what we call our supermarket service here in Australia. Yes. Uh, checkout chicks are supposedly uh -huh. saying, hey, you're earning $40,000 a year here. Come earn $100,000 a year driving trucks yep. in the mine. Yep. Um, clearly, it was an international discovery. Correct. And, and, you know, I think that's how the problem sorts itself out. Uh, listen, I grew up in the business. And when I was a youngster, and I'm not trying to say it's completely better now, but I would describe remote locations as probably not friendly places for most young women. <laughs> there were some women who grew up in the rackets, particularly if they had relatives present in the mine who were shielded from some of the worst of those activities. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that the problem is over. I'm trying to say it's very, very, very different than it used to be. And I think that managements will change, not merely because of ESG considerations, but simply uh, out of need. Uh, the industry has too many challenges in front of it to ignore the intellectual contributions of half of humankind. Uh, that makes me sound very woke, maybe for the first time in my career. The second thing that you're seeing is that maybe two decades of gradual, I hate to use the phrase, integration, means that increasingly more aspects of the mining business are being run by women, African people, Latin people, Native people. Uh, the truth is, and this is a very good thing, there's a whole broad range of perspectives. The idea that we had in the 1970s that all of the contributions that humankind had to offer mining were going to come from 4% of the population, which is to say old, bald, fat, white guys, you know, probably ignored the math of humankind. <laughs>